with us and uh, Deirdre, whom I see in the group, uh, and I believe Donna as well, uh, were there on that day and uh, we got some training. And it was interesting to me because although we weren't able to get together with Glenn since, he sort of dropped off the face of the earth, um, his method of using the walking stick for self-defense was based upon um, an ancestor. And I see somebody wants to come in, Sue, should I admit them? Oh, you've already done. Okay, so anyhow, his, um, his ancestor was a boxer. And the, the old Irish method of boxing, the hands were both up, okay? And what you were doing is you were swinging like this with the hands. So anyhow, here's a proper walking stick type shillelagh. This um, ancestor of Glenn's was involved in preventing whiskey stills in the hills from being broken up by excise men. And he was a boxer, so he was called upon to provide some self-defense. He had a stick and he realized pretty quickly that the methods of boxing could be used with the stick. So the stick was simply an extension upon the boxing method. Since the boxing is something that I had in my family, it made sense for me to put the two of them together. Now, before we get a little bit further into it, I just wanna talk a wee bit about the history because the history is fascinating and it goes way, way back. And stick fighting was so closely identified with the Irish character and Irish culture. And yet what happened was the Irish turned against it. And there were reasons for that, very good reasons for turning against it. But it's fair to say that stick fighting in Ireland and in Northern Europe goes back literally thousands of years. Now this, can you make that up? That's a bronze figurine. And it's from the Museum of Brittany. And it is an ancient Celtic warrior equipped with a blackthorn stick and with a shield. He's naked because the Gaelic or Celtic warriors in the old days, including in Ireland, they fought naked. The Romans were terrified of them. And uh, so this is a fighter from that period. And he's got a stick, probably of blackthorn, judging by the knob at the end. A knob like that. Okay. Now we know a little bit more about that period than we did because not too many years ago, there was an archeological find at a place called Tollensee in Germany. And uh, they found a site dating from about 1500 BC. So this is about the same time as the Trojan War and the fall of the city of Troy, where a battle took place involving, they think, thousands of people on both sides. And the weaponry was bronze, bronze axes, bronze knives, and wooden weapons. The wooden weapons consisting largely of blackthorn and oak. And because it's in a lake area, many of the wooden weapons have survived because of being in fresh water and uh, an area where there was not any oxygen. Now, the use of wooden weapons obviously survived the pagan period because here we have a carving from Ireland of medieval Irish saints, and they're holding in their hands the implements they used to convert the heathen. Okay, so there are your wooden weapons in the hands of the early saints. Um, there was a long history of fighting and stick fighting in Ireland. Uh, part of it stimulated by the fact that Ireland was an occupied country from the time of Cromwell on, and the Irish were not allowed to have steel weapons. And so they had wooden weapons, and the saying was that a man without a shillelagh is a man without a recourse. Here's an example of training, and it's something I shall refer to later. It's a man jigging, because jigging, of course, was a war dance. It was to train you with your footwork. Okay, uh, Deirdre told me about how she learned to jig from her dad and she used a shillelagh. So you'd be jigging with quick footwork and you're able to lash or to hit with your stick. So there's a man jigging 
And what's very interesting in this is that you can see that he's jigging in front of an old pagan standing stone. And this is particularly interesting because in the later uh, 1800s, when the Catholic Church was involved in suppressing the use of the shillelagh and fighting, uh, there was an association that they saw between stick fighting and paganism. And this sort of feeds into that. To give you an idea as to what the period could be like, this is a picture of a man and he looks scared. He's got his shillelagh in his hand, he's appearing in court. And he may well look scared because it's quite possible he's going to be hanged for the crime of not speaking English. You could only use English in court. A large portion of the Irish population spoke only Irish and therefore in court cases were incapable of defending themselves. And you see he's, he's uh, dressed up in his Sunday best and he's looking frightened and he doesn't have a very good haircut. There were a wide number of sticks used. This is from a text by John Hurley. And what you may find interesting is the one, uh, the two sticks that are the third and the fourth from the right may be familiar to people who know anything about hurling. Hurling is an Irish sport, an ancestor of hockey or field hockey. And those are a type of stick, I think called a common. Is that how you say it? C-A-M-A-N. And they are originally an ancient war stick. Um, one of the former presidents of Ireland is Mary McAleese. She grew up as a little girl in Derry. And uh, Derry was the center of sectarian violence at one point. And uh, Mary McAleese speaks of having carried a common on her way to school for self-defense not to play Hurley at school, but in order to defend herself so she could get to school. Sort of a terrible thing for a little girl or a little girl's parents to have to think about. And that's in the fairly recent past. Now this one, I hope you can see that. It's a very poor reproduction, but this is school in the old days. And it's a group of young fellows with their teacher and they're out in front of a pub with their shillelaghs. Now, there was no public school in the old days. Schools were either associated with specific universities or institutions of that sort, or with parishes. So you'd have parish schools and the shillelagh was such a basic item in Irish culture that no young fella would ever be hired by a school board to teach the kids if he didn't know how to use a stick because use of the stick was a basic part of the school curriculum. This is of course the period before the great famine of 1947 through to about 1851 or 52. So the shillelagh was very, very important and shillelagh fighting gave rise on the one hand to communal conflict. Um, initially over things like grazing rights and land. And the conflicts could be terrible. There is one account here for time reasons, I'm not gonna read the entire thing, but it's of um, a fight that took place in 1834. So after the famine, or no, before the famine, 1834, 1847. So shortly before the famine, um, over 2000 people involved on both sides, two communities. And at the end of the day, it is said that there were two to 300 men dead. So the stick fighting had really gotten out of control and it was being used to assert things like grazing rights, land rights, labor rights, things of that kind. And what became crucial was the fact that stick fighting became associated with the degradation of Irish culture. Um, at that point in Ireland, there was a movement for home rule. Um, and there was a real industry of depicting Irish people as animalistic. A great deal of emphasis on the fact that they were unfit 
to govern themselves and should be happy to have foreign landlords in control of their lands. This is a cartoon. And you can see it's called Loading the Shillelagh. And at the front down here, there are two figures who are pouring melted lead into the head of a shillelagh to turn it really into an instrument for murder. And the interesting thing about this is that half of the cartoon is missing. Over here on the right, on, on the left-hand side was a picture of a Catholic bishop. And the original caption was, Father so-and-so and his flock. So it was associating Roman Catholicism with this really incredibly awful behavior. So sectarianism and religion was being, um, was becoming more and more controversial as part of the Irish quest for independence and stick fighting was being used as something to condemn the church for. Now, in 1847, you have the beginning of the famine. Um, even today in Ireland, the period before the famine is called the time of the 8 million, which is what um, the population of Ireland was. The population of Ireland now is, I think, something like 5 million or 4 point something million. Um, you had an enormous diminution of the Irish population because of starvation and emigration. And uh, here we have a picture of a family that's about to be evicted from their home. And they've got the door braced and everybody's huddling together with the little kids. And you got a couple of the young fellow at the back with the shillelaghs prepared to resist the men of the bailiff who've come to throw them out. My own family came to Canada in 1851 on what were called the coffin ships. Uh, these were ships of immigrants fleeing Ireland to seek a better life in the new world. Here's a, a picture of one of them in his ragged clothes, looking at a poster advertising um, a life in New York. And of course he has a shillelagh over his shoulder. A lot of those men came to Canada and in Canada, they provided among other things, the major part of the workforce that was responsible for building the uh, canal that went from Kingston up to Ottawa. Uh, it had a total rise of around the Rideau Canal. It had a total rise of around 300 feet in the course of building the canal, roughly a thousand men died because of, and this seems so strange to us these days, but because primarily of malaria. Um, so it was really, really pretty brutal. When the canal was completed, they were laid off. So what were they to do to support themselves and wives and kids? And what happened was that most of them went into the lumber business in the Ottawa Valley. And, um, they had a hard time of it because they didn't have a lot of the basic skills they needed to work in the bush, plus the fact that the prejudice against the Irish had followed them. And uh, they did wind up getting employed, but it took violence. And the violence is commemorated in the Ottawa Labor Museum uh, in the photographs and records of something called the Shiner's War. The Shiner's War was a conflict where one of the uh, logging owners, one of the contractors, and interestingly enough, most of these men would have been Catholic. He himself was a Protestant, but what he did was uh, he sent his men with their fighting sticks into the bush to drive the workers of his competitors out. And it went on for a period of around nine years, and it became so extreme uh, that federal troops, British troops at that point, because this is before Confederation, had to be introduced to keep things in hand. But this is regarded in Canada, the Shiner's War, as being one of the most significant events in the fight for Canadian labor rights, something that Irish men were closely associated with in the United States and in Canada, the, the fight to be able to have unions, things of that kind. This is a picture from a somewhat later period of men in the Irish Valley, or rather in the Ottawa Valley, I'm sorry, holding their sticks. Most of the sticks are the handles of cant hooks. 
which is a logging implement for rolling logs, but you can see that they'd be quite suitable for fighting. And the young fella at the bottom right is holding a stick that is not a cant hook, and that seems to be a shillelagh. But this gives you an idea as to what the period was like. This looks to me like a photograph of a tintype. So it probably dates from around the 1860s or 70s in the Ottawa Valley, some about 30 years after the Shiners War. Uh, I've got quite a few things like cartoons that are depicting shillelagh and depicting Irish people in disreputable terms. However, I'd like before we go further, share with you a photograph I just love. And it is this photograph. I believe Deirdre has seen it. And this is a picture of young women of the Irish Citizens Army in 1916 being drilled with their sticks by Captain Jack White, who was the taller man wearing a fedora hat at the back. 1916, of course, was the outbreak of the GPO and the rebellion. Some of these men, uh, young women, may actually have been killed at that time. The role of women was largely written out of uh, revolutionary history after De Valera and his crew took over, but they were extremely important. And this particular exercise that they're doing is one I'm about to do with you in just a minute or two. Okay, but I find that just amazing. Doc, uh, Jack White, uh, Captain Jack White, he was a, quite an extraordinary man. He was involved uh, in the fight for Irish independence. He was condemned to death by the British. Um, Sometime after the 16, he was released from prison. Um, he went to Ireland where he became involved in the fight for women's rights. Um, he um, fought in the Spanish Civil War in the International Brigades in Spain and eventually stood for Parliament in England. And although he didn't win, it, he really was a man who had one hell of a career in terms of uh, his involvement in the fight for civil rights. So are there any comments or anything there that you want to have an extra, a second look at? Just unmute yourself and ask if there is. All right. Just, sorry, super, super interesting. Um, and this is off topic, but how, how long are the sticks that you're recommending for us to use today? Well, uh, let me show you. Okay. Okay. Basic walking stick, and I'm going to change the view so I can see myself here. There. And I'll pin my video, which I'm used to doing from my Tai Chi Zoom sessions. So this is your basic walking stick. This one's about 33 inches, 36 inches. Um, and as you can see, it's uh, one with a root knob. Now. What this is, this is a shrub, and this is underneath the ground. So this is the root knob and you would have the roots going out on either side and somebody would dig it up and you trim off the roots and then you clip off the branches. And so that's what you're left with. You sometimes see outlandish things where these are depicted as being thorns, but they're not. They're the, the stubs where the branches have been snipped off and left a little bit rough. Ideally, you want something that you can get your hands around like that. And you see the basic position is about shoulder width apart. But this is only one option. Here are th three others. This is a fighting stick, a bata. This one is made of persimmon. And I have four of these. Um, usually these are made of hardwoods. Persimmon is a hardwood and it's interesting, it's a light hardwood, but very, very tough. Um, and I don't know where you can get these now. The man that I bought it from it has now retired. So I don't know where these are available. But that's an alternative to these and you can really only get these from Ireland. They're or Ireland or the Northern Baltic. So that's what's known these days as a uh, Salele or shillele. This one here, it might be, it might be, you know, shillele for a leprechaun or someone who's extremely tiny, but this is called 
what this would be called a capine. And it's not a walking stick. The only thing it's good for is fighting. And it would be held in the middle like this. Okay, and the idea was that the bottom part was to protect your elbow and the arm. If a blow was coming in, you'd block. And the force of the blow would help snap the other root ball part into your opponent. So it would be held like this or like that. And you'd be blocking. And so that's a capin. Very seldom seen these days because obviously it's only good for mayhem. It's not good for um, being a walking stick. And this one is in the family. And then the final thing, which is amusing, is an umbrella. Any good stout umbrella will do. This is a bit of an unusual umbrella. It is a real honest to God brawly. Okay, it opens and closes. However, the shaft is made of titanium and the ribs are made of steel. And it actually is designed for people who want something on hand for self-defense. Uh, you can get them for about 200 bucks. It's called the unbreakable umbrella. Uh, there is a ladies version, which has fiberglass ribs to take a little bit of weight out. But uh, this is a pretty serious piece of ordnance. But aside from that, it's just one hell of a good umbrella. You know, the lightweight cheap umbrellas, you buy one and then uh, before too long it's broken or, you know, the canopy is coming apart. You can buy extra canopies for these because the umbrella itself, the hardware, will not wear out. So that's a good alternative. But any kind of umbrella will do for what we're doing. I have one document, um, article reprinted from the period before the San Francisco earthquake. And it is by a lady who with her husband taught self-defense in San Francisco, which is a pretty wild and woolly place if you go back to the uh, 1880s and 1890s. And uh, anyhow, the photograph, it's a picture. She's got this big hat with the feathers and everything else. And she's got her umbrella and she's explaining how to use the umbrella for self-defense, how to fight with an umbrella for self-defense. And it's basic stick fighting. She uh, points out, however, that you have to be serious about it because if you use certain techniques with the umbrella on somebody, the person who's on the receiving end will be, as she puts it, a candidate for the undertaker. So um, let's start off just by, we were, in, we're indoors here. I'm gonna use my capine with a great deal of, no, I can't use it. But let's just start off and very gently, let's wind up by swinging our arm. Just circle the arm, nice and loose, everything relaxed. Nice and loose, getting the shoulder wound up, both arms. Okay, now take your walking stick or your umbrella, whatever you have. And you see, because of the two-handed method I'm going to be teaching, one of the big things is to space the hands. So the hands are constant. So right now, just take the umbrella, bring it down so it's on your thighs, and then bring the arms up and flex the palms up. So you're curling the hand up and then down like that. So what you're doing is you're warming up the muscles of the arm on this side and on this side. So there's a curl and here's an extension. And a curl and extend. When you do the extension, you can feel that your biceps are working. When you do the curl down, you can feel that the tricep in here is getting activated. So curl and extend. And curl and extend. Make sure that the shoulders stay relaxed. 
You don't want to be doing anything like this. You want everything to be nice and soft coming up and going down. Coming up and going down, just like that. And now thinking about those girls in the Irish Citizens Army, we're doing this, bend a little bit, and now up on your tiptoes. This is what they were doing, and then down. And then once again, up on your tiptoes and back down. Relax the back, relax the butt. Up and down. And up and down. Now, here, take my right hand and I put it touching the left shoulder. One side and then the other. So what I'm doing is I'm stretching the back of the shoulder and I'm activating the deltoid. So one side and then the other, back and forth. Touch the knuckles of one hand to the opposite shoulder. Back and forth. Then put the out in front of you and being gentle, turn. Warm up the waist one way to the middle, turn the other way. Don't twist your knees. There should be minimal involvement of the pelvis turning to the right or the left. This should be very gentle. To the right. One thing, by the way, about that picture of the young women in 1916 working with their sticks is that simply by appearing in public and doing that, that was demonstrating the fact that they were thoroughly modern young women. They were not to be trifled with because the stick was something at that point that was associated with men and which had fallen into considerable disfavor. So once again, up, and down, nice and loose, right, left, right, left. Now, also, this is where we're blending uh, what we're doing into the first of our techniques, up and down. This is a ready stance for self-defense. Doesn't look it, but it is. Somebody reaches out to push you or grab you and you snap it up. Okay, you can snap up, you can snap down. And this action here with the wrist is giving you an additional amount of snap. Just that might be enough to put off someone who is planning and getting rough. So we're doing this very slowly in the warm up, and then boom, 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 up and down, just like that. And those of you who do Tai Chi with me, you will understand that this is commencement of Tai Chi, but done with the weapon. So up and down. Now, another method is the crossing punch. For this, you need to be able to see my feet. And I'm going to adjust the screen here so you get a somewhat better view. What I'm doing is I'm going like this and like that. So I'm lifting my heel and I'm turning on the ball of the foot one way and then the other way. Up, one way, up, the other way. So you have to come up before you turn. It's a bit of a dance move. Up, turn, down. Up, turn, down. Up, down. Up, down. Up, down. You're swiveling, pivoting on both feet. Now, where the stick comes in, and this is a warm up as well as a punching technique. Is your hands are positioned like this, um, about one third to a quarter of the way in from the end, in line with your shoulders. So if you've done this, you've got a punch of something coming in. And you're pivoting on the ball of the foot, coming up and down. And what you're doing is you're whacking the person with this. 
or with this. So it's a very forceful block or parry. So you've got the snap up and down. Here you've got a punch here and you've got a punch here. And my feet are swiveling on the ground. When I'm doing this as a warm up, what I wanna do is I wanna start here and I wanna place my left hand or my right hand on my left knee. And by doing this, you are ensuring that you're not making the mistake of trying to hit with your arms like this. The muscles of the arms are not very big. They're not very powerful. If you try to hit somebody like that, you're not gonna be able to defend yourself effectively. This allows you to put the entire body behind the strike. So the whole, whole body is twisting, the legs are coming up, the torso is twisting, and all of that force is being transmitted to that small area. Okay, so across and down, across and down. Now I'm showing this with the arms fully extended. It also could be much, it could be in here. It could be quite a bit closer. But if you wanna get the benefit on the back, you can do this fairly slowly, pivot and have the arms fully extended and go down, touch the knee, come around, really stretch and relax the back as you do this, one side and then the other. So we have two techniques so far. We got the straight snap up and down at the front, and now we have the crossing punch. This can be a crossing punch or here, this is a hook. As punching goes, crossing punch is like this, okay? Hook is like this. And hooking, you're in closer. Crossing punch, you're out a bit further. The other point that I should make is that this is not sport. I have no interest whatsoever in faction fighting or the use of the stick in tournaments, things of that kind. So this is strictly self-defense. And at this point, if an individual is offering violence to you, they're going to be receiving violence in return and you hit them as hard as you can. So the assumption is that you are not simply going to discourage them, but that you are going to make them incapable of continuing their attack. So this is serious stuff, okay? It's not something to be done recreationally. This is when the chips are down and you have a real problem. And if you don't sort it out to your advantage, you may wind up, who knows, maybe even being killed. So here, snap up, get away from me. Here, boom, boom. And the target for this sort of thing, obviously, is the head. The head's the brain box. What you're doing is you're trying to knock the person out or make them incapable of continuing. Now, the other method that comes right out of this is this. This is called the bayonet stab. And this is the technique that that lady in San Francisco said could have such dire consequences. Um, obviously, if you do something like this, applying it to the person's neck, they may die. Okay, so you don't go there unless you're prepared for whatever the consequences are legally. Okay, however, in here, okay, and the gut and the probe, you know, taking out some ribs, something like that. This is a very small area. And if you put your weight in between, I'm behind that or in, be in behind this, you've got something that can inflict quite a bit of damage. So three techniques, the getaway, the circle, okay, the crossing punch, and the bayonet stab. When you do the bayonet stab, the stick travels 
in a straight line like that. Okay, so it doesn't arc around, do anything of that kind. It's coming in and it's straight. And you'll notice that I have both hands on the stick all the way through. There are a lot of techniques that involve having one hand off the stick. And this is how one of the methods of, one of the primary methods of stick plating, the Andrum style uh, works. However, for purposes of senior citizens and self-defense, if you have both hands on your stick, there's less of a chance of someone else getting the stick away from you. Now, in the website for the unbreakable umbrella, it's really quite amusing. I love their ads. At one point, they have one of these umbrellas and they have it in between two chairs. So it's, it's, it's lying down like this between two chairs and the seats of the chairs. And this great big fella gets up, climbs up on top of it and stands on top of it like this. And they're demonstrating that not only does it not break, but you could open and close it after. Well, um, on the same website, they talk about how if somebody grabs your stick. How you do is you get the stick in line and then you pull away from them. And the only problem is that technically speaking, that doesn't work. It's a self-defense method that doesn't work because if they've got the stick, it's, what, this is like a tug of war. They're, you're pulling one way, they're pulling the other way and you, you might not be able to get away from it. The, if somebody grabs your stick and pulls, you go with them and you serve them. Okay, you don't try to get control of the stick back. You circle around their hand and go in after them. You know, punch, punch, punching. Um, you can circle under their hand. You can circle over their hand. No matter how they've grabbed you, whether it's the stick is in here, whether they've grabbed it at one end or another, all of these, if you practice and if you have someone to show you a few of the tricks like me, these are ways of locking them up, of getting them away from you. So these are simple methods. Okay, so the snap up to the front or snap down, the crossing punch one way or then the other, and the bayonet stab here or here. And then to get away from somebody, you don't try to get away. If they're pulling you, you step into them and circle the stick. Just step in and circle the stick. Step in as they grab and circle the stick. And you've got two hands. Even if they've got two hands on your stick, they're expecting you to try to get away or to pull away from them. That's not involved. You go after them. You go after them and do the circle so they're tied up. When somebody grabs you, they're grabbing something that they expect to be able to control. So what you do is you change the situation. Instead of getting into a tug of war like this, you step in, you close the distance. All of a sudden you're in that, you, you are in their space and what's their reaction? What's going on here? That's fine for you. So this isn't very pretty stuff. Um, you can use the stick as an implement for exercise to work your back and your body. Um, you can understand all the musculature that is involved. There are a lot of other methods that you can use with the stick. I've just given you some of the most basic ones. The snap, the crossing punch, the bayonet stab, and the release, circling. Now, a little bit of a departure. The first great American celebrity athlete back in the 1920s was a young fellow of Irish ancestry from Colorado named Jack Dempsey. And he was the heavyweight champion of the world. He wasn't a huge man, a big man, but he had terrific punching power, enormous punching power. Um, and there is, um, a video taken of him when he was young, and he's out on a road somewhere in New York State with his trainers, and he's training, and he's got a stick, and he's running, and he turns, and he runs backwards, 
and he's running forwards and then he'll run sideways and he'll run sideways. And you see he's doing that with a stick because it's training him in how to coordinate the hand with the footwork. You know, you're, you're going one way, going the other way, backing up, going forward. And in each case, it's as if he's holding an invisible stick. So the invisible stick is one of the basic principles of old fashioned Irish pugilism. Uh, Jack Dempsey, as I said, he was a celebrity athlete uh, and is considered to be one of the greatest boxers who ever lived. One of his modern disciples is a fellow named Mike Tyson. And I've seen an interview on YouTube of Mike Tyson talking about how he just worships the technique of Jack Dempsey because of the power that Jack had in his punching. It's something that Tyson studied. And as you know, he was considered to be back in the day, a really serious knockout artist. Okay. And I think that was around 45 minutes. So we did it pretty much on time. Are there questions? Is there anything you'd like to ask? Hi. Hello, so your stance was open with two hands up and down. Yeah. Do your full blocking. Yeah. The style that I, I learned showed to take your power hand, whether you're right-handed or left-handed, and reverse the hand. And you do all the, all the same moves. It gives you all the same strikes, but with the power hand in front, allows you to strike over as that well. Is, so just that is really front. interesting. Where is the style from? Uh, Florida. Wow. Very so, interesting. So say all the same exacts on your on your sides, except yeah. with one hand. That way, if somebody grabs your stick, it allows more flexibility with your arms in yeah. full contact with the stick. Yeah. Instead of getting forced into your thumbs immediately. Well, with this one, what you're after, you want the hands basically paw up because your basic fighting stance is like this. Okay. Or it could be like that which is the, the method in my family, where you've got one hand that is the trapper and the other hand, which is the power punch. And it's the power side that is toward the opponent. Correct. Like that. And you've got also the ability to use like in 52 blocks, the shrug with the shoulder, yep. and use the elbow when you come in. So um, many, many different styles. Thank you for sharing that. That's an interesting one. But for this, you're snapping from down from there. The other thing too, is if you're standing with the stick across your thighs, it doesn't look particularly aggressive. You're not suggesting violence. You're not offering violence, but you're ready for it. Okay. Um, another little thing about carrying a stick. Um, had a little dog with us for a while, not long enough. Uh, but when she was uh, quite crippled up and old, um, had her out for a walk at night, and I'm in a, an apartment building right beside Victoria Park, and there was a nice big coyote that crossed the sidewalk in the street right in front of us. And I didn't feel bad having a stick on me. You see them all over the place now in town. Uh, they, they do nab the occasional cat, but if my little old dog had wound up uh, having a problem, I had my stick. I had a recourse. I was like that young man in court. One thing that is amusing, uh, I hope it's okay for me to go on a little bit, Sue, but hurling. Hurling was um, an Irish counterpart to international rules soccer, and it was promoted by the church who assisted in the formation of the Gaelic Athletic Association in Ireland in about 1880. But hurling is an ancient game. It goes way, way back, and it was a war game. And there were two kinds of hurling game. The one was of two teams from different villages, and it was in a field, you know, the ancestor of today's soccer pitch. Um, the other one was over a period of maybe a couple of square kilometers, and it was between two villages. And those games involving the villages, the score at the end of the day was always one to zero. Because you would get one team that eventually got into the main street of the other village and they scored a goal and the goal was right in front of the pub. 
well, this is a good time to win the game and go in and have a beer with the fellows on the other side. But you see that, that game that was over a couple of kilometers, it would involve strategy. It would involve tactics. It would involve false attacks and getting your, your opponent out of position. It was a complete game that would inculcate into the community principles of strategy. You know, a way of having a militant population that was capable of defending itself. Now, when they established um, the Gaelic Athletic Association back in 1880, they had to clean the game up. So they had the old hurling and the old hurling was a game where you could hit the other guy with your stick and you could throw, you could have jacket and hip throws. Uh, there was another sport in Ireland, a, a martial method called collar and sleeve wrestling. Okay, very similar to stand up judo. This was enormously popular along with the shillelagh and the stick fighting. So it taught hip throws and all kinds of stuff. And that was part of hurling. If the other fellow had the ball on a stick, you could grab him and throw him and then head off in the other direction. So they had to get rid of the throws. They had to get rid of the, uh, the hitting the other people with the sticks. They had to make it something that was a little bit more civilized. So never say that the church has never done anything for us. Alrighty, any other questions? Steve? Yes, Gary. So what about Irish dancing? Is that, is, does it have any role in it? do you want to answer that question? So do they use, do they use dancing for footworks and kicking? Well, yeah, because it's, uh, it's a good aerobic workout. The music is quite fast and you can travel a long distance just hopping about and doing a jig. And as Steve said, if you incorporate holding a stick at the same time, you can get the arms going at the same time and you can go forwards, backwards and to the side. Just like Jack but Dempsey. It's a great, yeah, great warm up technique. Yeah. Uh, so you, and uh, we have one of the people, uh, Gary, that you know in the club is Randall. Okay, big Randall. He has uh, had training with the boxer. And one of the sayings in boxing is that 90% of it is in the feet. Now, the other thing too, well, I, I'm not going to go into teaching in this because it's a but um, I demonstrated earlier the punching method. Okay, and the punching method in the old method is done with the heel of the palm and it's spiraling out. This hand is the proper. So that's a straight punch. Now, just as you have a crossing punch and you've got hooks going up, hooks down, you've also got a straight punch with the stick. And it looks like this. Okay, and, you're, and you can hit, hit. And what's happening is you're bouncing the stick off the forearm. So you don't want to have an over rotation like that, which can cause you to sprain your arm. So this is the Irish method. There are other methods you can use. But this is positioned hands in from the end for the other method, hoping that the other person doesn't notice, you shift toward the center and then boom and you're giving a good whack with the end. Okay, so once again, it's just like this, except you're doing it with a stick. So the stick is simply extending the natural capacity of your body. Uh, that's one that takes some practice, but uh, it's a very quick, snappy method. Okay? Yes, yeah, Steve, I just want to ask you about that snapping method that you taught us. I, I believe when you were teaching us that we had the weight on the, fir on the front uh, foot, the ball of the foot, that was weighted and the back foot was not quite as weighted. Is that correct? Um, not quite. What you're referring to is one of Jack Dempsey's principles and it's a basic principle of Irish boxing and it's called the falling step. Okay, you may recall me referring to that. Now, the falling step is I'm like this and the rear heel is off the ground. The feet are not far apart. My weight is partly on that rear foot. And all I have to do is to lift the front foot. And you have an explosive movement going forward. 
So it's not a matter of shifting the weight to the back foot and then stepping out. That's too slow. That's what they call telegraphing the punch. This method was the rear heel off the ground, the plantar tendon flexed. This hand's the trapper. This hand is protecting the ribs and it's your power hand. And you're stepping forward and I'm just raising that front foot. <clears throat> okay, like that. So the weight's shared between the feet, but at the, time, at the moment that you're delivering the punch, all of the weight on the front foot. If you're gonna, at the point of delivering the punch, there's no purpose in having weight there. It's boom. And this should be just about empty. Everything being rooted through the front foot. Tailbone dropped, the middle part of the back open so that Newton's third law, which governs the idea of reactive force is going down to the foot. Okay, it's not pushing you back. It's not knocking you off the target. Bang, bang, working in. So that's the falling step. Dempsey's principles, um, they included the falling step. They included what he called whirling shoulders. And you can see that we did that with our sticks. And it also involved springy legs. And that's what we did with that first thing. You put the legs into that snap up and snap down and you've got something that is quite explosive. There's no point in moving and boxing if you don't move fast, but there's also no point in moving and boxing if you, if you don't have any control. You have to have control. Um, you have to have control so that at the very least when you get a chance, you can do the intelligent thing and run away. Already? And remember, it's not about winning the fight. It's about surviving it. It's about preventing a fight, ideally, by putting the other person out fast. But you simply want to get home safe. Yeah, that's what it's about. Okay, can Gary? I, can I, can I, can Gary? Can I, can I, oh, Trish? Yeah, can I ask a question about the length of the stick? Um, sure. So I don't know how tall you are. Does the stick... Uh, length have anything to do with your own height? Yes, absolutely. Um, this one is long, but um, my own feeling is that nurses and physios who are fitting out older people with walking sticks tend to make them too short. Okay, and the result is if you see people with sticks that are too short, and they're reaching out like this in front of them when they're walking. What you should do ideally is to have a stick or when you're standing like this, you got to bend at the elbow and you can put the stick out and touch the ground in front of you and you're not bending over. Another thing in connection with this, look at people with their walkers. It's terrible, these old people and they have walkers and they have to bend over to use the walker or the stroller because the handlebars are too short. You should be able to stand up and to walk like this. But you know, if you, if you have a stick that requires you to reach out and to bend at the waist or a walker or stroller where you're like this, you're halfway into a fall already. So in answer to your question, this is about the right length for me. Okay, I'm able to put the, the stick down beside my foot and my arm is not straight. They tend nurses to position it from the wrist. That's a little bit short. It's gotta be able to go out there. This one here is 39 inches and it's a bit further out. This one is a fighting stick. I have, this is a little bit long for a strict walking stick but I can reach out in front of me. And there are times when I've actually used sticks like this in the winter time on ice, steady myself. Okay, so here are two sticks and you can see there's quite a variety or quite a range between them in terms of their length. I, I like working with a variety of sticks. Um, so I'm used to the different lengths, but if you're gonna do something like this. This is about right. Have a good bend at the elbow, less than 90 degrees, and you should be able to stand up and put the stick out and tap it 
on the ground in front of you. The umbrella, for my purposes, and of course, I don't have that much choice when I'm buying a $200 umbrella. This is not quite long enough for me. Okay, it's too close. But umbrellas, they tend to be a little bit shorter. But you want to have something that you can reach up like that. You want to have something where you can grip it about a quarter to a third in from the end, and you've got a serious amount of shaft on both sides that you can connect with. Okay, like that from one side to the other. Is this okay, Trish? That's great, thank you. Okay, are there other questions? Okay, if there aren't, um, Sue, I guess you get to take it away. Wonderful. Um, I just want to say thank you, Steve. That was so interesting. Um, I had done some reading on it, but boy, did I learn a lot today. So that was wonderful. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And um, we hope you stay safe with your sticks and your umbrellas and stay well from all the other things going on. And uh, hope you join us again. And I, if I can make one observation, if you have a stick, take it for walks. <laughs> You know, pretend it's like a puppy, like a dog, <laughs> and take it for walks. Like you, the more you handle your stick, the more intimately familiar you are with it, the better. It should be something that you're completely familiar with. So, you know, take it for walks. However, if you start threatening people, I don't know you. <laughs> right? And I've never met you. You're a friend of Sue's, not me. <laughs> okay. So. Thank you, Steve. Good so everybody. Thank, Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.